Hi, folks. I'm just part of the workshop team, but it's a pleasure to see all of you here. I can't really see you, but um, I'm Jay Steinbacher. I am Clarion West's workshop manager, and I am incredibly excited to welcome Usman T. Malik. Usman is a Pakistani American writer, a doctor, a Clarion West alumnus from the class of 2013, and a first time instructor for us. He's also the co founder of the Salam Award for Imaginative Fiction, which aspires to find and nurture speculative fiction writers of Pakistani origin. Despite all of this, and being a winner of the Bram Stoker Award, the Crawford Award, and the British Fantasy Award, and having stories uh, in tons of years best anthologies, I am not gonna list all of those, he admitted he was nervous to teach for us this year. He's probably very nervous sitting here right now. I'm just gonna put you on the spot. Um, but so far he's offered our students memorable stories, wondrous settings, and a whole lot of compassion and wisdom. We honestly couldn't ask for more to bring our class together in this first week. One of Usman's most memorable encouragements has been to our students to be like the magpie and take inspiration from everything that you encounter. So I hope that all of you in the audience will leave this reading feeling inspired to create your own magical worlds. And uh, with that, I leave you in Usman and Nisi's wonderful hands. Should have checked this earlier. Is this working? Okay, cool. How about yours? Yeah? Hopefully, yes. Yes, yeah. good, good, okay. So um, I, I gotta take off my glasses to, to see this stuff tempted to just ask you questions that I want the answers to, Usman. <laughs> but I'm going to try and space those sorts of geek out moments between questions that I'm pretty sure our audience is more interested in. So <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. So let's begin with some of that. Um, okay, so first round, you speak several languages yes yes i speak three languages what what are those languages so english urdu and punjabi and i can read a little bit of arabic and farsi wow no norwegian no will do hi snitabana um so what does that do to your writing to speak all those languages you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think I had a conversation with one of the students today about this. Um, um, I think that such polyphony for me has lent um, itself to my writing for sure. I do think that it helps with the music of the language. I'm a big music and writing person. We've talked about this quite a bit. And um, for me, the musicality of language almost always supersedes the grammar of language. Um, and I find that bringing in the intonations, the lyricism of the subcontinental, uh, of subcontinent poetry like ghazals and music um, has for sure formed my voice mm -hmm. and the way I approach language as a living, moving thing, a very sinuous thing to be played with, to be teased apart. Um, and I think uh, for me, that has been important um, Caitlin R. Kiernan has talked about this um, in, in their work. Um, and they've talked about this idea of, you know, language itself being the plot sometimes. And I do like that idea. I do like the idea of, you know, lush language being the plot and the raison d'etre of uh, stories. I hear you. I hear you. Um, are you at all drawn to translating from one of these languages to another, um, it does do you do you feel like that is something that you're interested in doing or not? Um, so you know, um, my mother tongue Urdu is not really my mother tongue. So Urdu and English are both imperial languages. Mm. They are Urdu is the language of the Mughal court, or it kind of was forced upon. I'm actually Punjabi. So my language is supposed to be Punjabi, but I grew up in a country and in a culture where Punjabi was thought to be a rural language, kind of like, you know, like a Southern accent in the US. 
where people want to move away from it because uh, it is resonant of illiteracy for a lot of people. So, so sort of like rednecky. Kind of like that. And so Punjabi is rednecky for my part of the world, and which is such a pity because it's such a beautiful ancient language. So I do not, I'm not very fluent in Punjabi as much as I should be. My parents were. And I asked my parents when I grew up, why did you not talk to us in Punjabi? And they said, well, you would have sounded illiterate. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Right. And so Urdu and uh, English are both imperial languages. So I moved when I started writing in English, I lost a lot of my Urdu and Punjabi vocabulary to the point that English now is my first language. I'm most comfort comfortable in English as my language of expression rather than the other two. In the last one year, however, I've been re-immersing myself into the language, uh, into my language. Roots. I'm a big person also about the history of words yeah. and the etymology of language. And so I've been trying to learn where these Urdu expressions come from. You know, there's a very, there's a really pretty expression in Urdu. Um, uh, it's the, it's the laden, it's the bow laden with fruit that bends the most. It's about humility, right? And so it, I found it really difficult to translate it when I first encountered the expression, but it's so simple. You can do it, but you do lose the music of the language. Um, I am interested in translation at some point, but probably not at the cost of my original work. And, well, yeah, we want to keep that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question, totally different topic. Um, I was thinking about uh, how you talk about um, the Thousand and One Nights um, uh, as a, an inspirational uh, I could call it a collection of, of stories. Um, those are fairy tales. So, yeah. So the Thousand and One Nights is something I became obsessed with in the last five years. And so the Knights culture and scholarship is its own entire field, wow. multiple fields. A lot of Gothic literature in English actually comes from the Knights. Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, Edgar Allan Poe, <clears throat> Jorge uh, Borges, um, um, and uh, so so there's an overlap with horror then. Oh, absolutely! The Arabian Nights or the Thousand and One Nights have horrific scenes in them. There are uncanny rooms within rooms. There are ebony horses locked up in rooms for a thousand years. The Arabian Nights is a shuffling, uh, ever moving. Uh, jigsaw puzzle. And so the original, the manuscript of the Arabian Night, 1001 Nights, the earliest manuscript is from the 9th century. The latest manuscript that was found is from the 17th century. So it's a thousand, more than a thousand years of literature, which actually interestingly now is thought to be of Indian origin. Mm. Um, there is an Indian collection called the Ocean of the Stream of Stories. Um, from which the Thousand Nights is supposed to actually have been based on. It moved from India to Persia to Fatimi, the Cairo, and then to Morocco. So the movement of the Knights is almost as if there's a movement of history going on. So that collection, uh, there are several version, uh, versions. My favorite right now is the great um, Syrian French um, poet Yasmin Seals uh, illustration, uh, uh, translation. It's called The Annotated Arabian Nights. And there's a great essay uh, by Robert Irvin about the history of, it's a 40 page essay about the history of the Knights, if anyone is interested. The Annotated Arabian Nights by Yasmin Seal. Yeah, I, I didn't call it the Arabian Nights because hey, it's not Arabian. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, but I was thinking about that in terms of the Grimm's fairy tales as well. Um, are you familiar with those? Yeah, there's like, um, those are also horrific. <laughs> um, there's supposedly fairy tales, but then there's like Cinderella's stepsisters cutting off their toes. And yeah, there's there's buried bodies under the juniper tree and all that kind of stuff. So um, do you do you see your work uh, as much as it's sparked by this sort of thing as like um, a recontextualizing maybe, or? Do you mean recontextualizing of folklore and fairy tales? Yeah. 
I think so. Um, I do work a lot with folklore. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to dig into old folk stories from my part of the world and playing with them. Um, I was never interested in retelling Western stories because uh, fairy tales because they've been done and no one was doing Eastern fairy tales. Interestingly, the reading that I have tonight is actually a retelling of an Arabian Nights story. Um, so the, that was going to be my excerpt. And I never tried it till actually I went to uh, a workshop with uh, Karen Joy Fowler and Kelly Link. And um, Kelly and I were talking about this. And I said, you know, I've never tried my hand at fairy tales. And Kelly's like, well, you know, you don't have to retell fairy tales. You can write fairy tale adjacent stories. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, you don't have to retell the story, but maybe there's a point in the story that irks you. There's one moment or a character and you get obsessed with it and you can create a story of, out of that moment. And that was immediately like there was a flash in my head and I wanted to do that. And I did that with an Arabian night story where there's one story that had always bothered me. I hated the way the story went. Is that the Enchanted City? No. So this is the City of Red Midnight. Oh, yes. That was the other one. I See, I picked the wrong one to ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's all those nested tales. Yes, correct. Yeah. Very cool. Is that what you're going to read from? I'm going to read an excerpt from the City of Red Midnight. Okay. But I'm going to ask a couple more questions before sure. then. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask about themes. Um, according to... Samuel Delaney, who I always have to bring up every time I talk to anybody about anything. Um, it, themes are, are things that your readers decide. You don't like put themes in there, but your readers find them anyway. Um, I, in past um, interviews of yours that I've studied closely, <laughs> um, you list two themes, childhood and transformations. Do you stand by those? I think that um, a lot of work that I did when I wrote them, I was not thinking about themes. See? I was, I was, I wanted to tell certain things that were important to me and formulate them in different narratives. It was only when I went back and I started reading them and other people actually had to point them out to me. Uh, for example, when I was at Clarion with my very dear friend, Shannon was sitting right there. I'm so pleased she's here. Um, John Clute took me aside and in my one-on-one -on -one he said, well, so your stories are those of self-exile. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And I had never thought about migration as self-exile. I, it had just never occurred to me. So Roberto Bolaño has that line about the melancholy folklore of exile, right? And it spoke so deeply to me. I had never even thought about that till Clute brought it up. And after that, I realized that that was correct. That was actually a good reading of my work. Of course, since then, I've done many, I hope I've done other things. But that was the first time someone told me what I was doing. They, they do like to tell you what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and they also like to tell you what you write. Um, you have been told that you write horror. Is that correct? Do you? I thought I was writing horror. They tell me I'm writing fantasy. Oh. So <laughs> do you let them tell you what it is? Not anymore. So I used to be I used to be able to define things and say things the way I, mean, I would want to voice what I was doing. I try not to do that anymore. And I think I've tried to talk to our students about this as well, about, you know, uh, moving away from siloing. Um, I think yeah. it's a useful. They are useful things to think about. Um, uh, they're useful ways of thinking about things. I believe it was Joe Hill who said to us that a genre is a conversation between writers past, present and future. And I do like that way of formulating things, but I do think there's way more to it than that. Um, I just want to write Usman Malik stories, and I hope people will follow me. If I'm if I'm honest enough, and if I work hard enough, I hope people will follow me where I want to go. So you don't take issue with the labels that people put on your work. 
I do not. I'm pretty generous that way. <laughs> I I try to be generous about it because, you know, people are going to, otherwise critics, how are they going to make a living? I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. People have got to make a living. Marketers got to make a living. Booksellers got to make a living. So I, I'm like, you know, that's fine. But I don't want to think about genre when I'm sitting down to write a story. Otherwise, there would be no Ted Chiang. There would be no Kelly Link. There would be no Nissi Shaw. There would be no Chip Delaney, right? Yeah, yeah. He 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 got to write sword and sorcery stuff because he was like, I'm going to do that. Um, I wonder sometimes how much um, race plays into people's perception and labeling and how much culture and gender play into it. Um, because I've written stories with like ghosts and dead people in them. And I've been told that that's horror. And I'm like, wait, no, they're just dead people. <laughs> you know, dead people like you see everywhere. So the genre question is almost always interesting in that way, right? Um, so in the in South Asia, in the Indo-Pak subcontinent, or in the Indian subcontinent, rather, people don't think of genre and litfic in that way. Historically, they haven't. Um, and so people were reading everything, right? So our great epics were all fantasy. The epic of Amir Hamza, Amar Ayar, um, the, the, uh, again, A Thousand and One Nights, they were all fantasy. They were all mixed up. They were, they were social satire. They were, so, you know, the Arabian Nights is really merchant stories. It's, these are stories of trade and commerce. People sitting in these squares and orals and doing this oral storytelling about things that were important to them. And so, again, trade, race, there's huge amounts of racism in the Thousand and One Nights, huge. And there, and where there was not racism, people, Orientalists, made sure they translated it as racism. <laughs> Yasmin Seal talks about that, right? Yeah. Because she is, she, uh, she sits on the doorway between the East and the West. Her grandfather was the great Arab poet Adonis. And so she sits on that doorway and she talks about it both as a person of color and from the Western perspective, because that's how she was trained. Uh -huh. And so I think, um, again, beloved Toni Morrison. Right. Is that genre or not? Right. Or who cares? <laughs> yeah. So I, I absolutely think culture, um, your upbringing, even the language makes a difference. Yeah. So, but if you were writing horror. What about those other two doctors that are also writing horror? Um, there's uh, Toby Ogundiran. Um, there's Justin Key, who was also a Clarion West graduate. What about medicine disposes its, <laughs> its practitioners to writing horror? I, I think that one is pr pretty much self-explanatory. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll just move on then. <laughs> uh, one more question. Um, and, and do you do you enjoy reading your own work and rereading it? Do you like doing that? I mean, I like reading mine, but I know there are people who don't like reading their own stuff. Uh -oh. I, I'm ambivalent about reading out in public. That I don't mind as much, although I'm not a super big fan of it. I can do it. I don't like rereading my older stories because I can't help but want to fix them. And, you know, Chip also said, you know, just because your stories are published don't mean you don't get to revise them. Well, yeah. Right? And so I was like, oh my God. Now that's another stress. <laughs> Well, can you read something to us without fixing it, please? <laughs> sure. I mean, yes, yes. I'm looking at you, Eileen. I know you hate your work. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to read from City of Red Midnight, um, a hikayat. The word hikayat um, basically means a fable, a moral lesson as well, maybe an allegory sometimes. 
So the context of the story is a bunch of these people have flown into Lahore for Lahore Comic Con, which has never happened, by the way, in real life. So, hey, I'm hoping, right? And so they're here for a panel, and they're going to be on a panel about storytelling tomorrow morning, and they're talking about how colonialism has effect affected storytelling and shaped narratives and erased stories. So they're sitting in this tea house, right? And they're all having conversation, most of, most of them in their 20s. And this person approaches them, a random, a rando, right? Okay. As they will. And the rando is like, you know, I couldn't help but overhearing you were talking about stories. And I can tell you a story. And if you wish, I will tell you a story. So they're like, well, okay, we're stuck with this guy now, but he's kind of intriguing. So like, okay, sure, come on up, right? And so he pulls up a chair and they offer him tea and yellow cake. And he sits down and this is what he says. Listen, my new Gore friends, cried Baba Kahani, rising to his feet, becoming taller by the act. As I tell you a story first told by the sages of Samarkand, buried in the annals of history, lost to centuries of marauding and pillaging, then revived in the rumors of the unlettered, the street sons, who seeded it into the bosoms of the troubadours, and finally passed it to us through the songs of those sweet lipped Over time when stars and sorcerers ruled the fate of man, this is a story of a land well removed from us, yet so close you could almost reach out and pluck its pearls, like our prophet, midst a divine trance, once parted the world's veil and nearly plucked a pomegranate from a tree of heaven. Baba Kahani sighed. His hands drew towards his mouth, forming a prayer bowl, then flew forth, coming apart, as if releasing the subtlest of enchantments into the evening. Listen, listen, my dear Gore Sahabs, the storyteller whisper chanted. Now, with your permission, I recount to you, too, the marvelous tale of Temur the trickster and the moon mad roses. It has reached me, my friends, that there once lived in the god guarded city of Old Lahore a trickster named Temur. This Temur was from a family of apothecaries and hakims. He made a living by selling medicines, sherbets, and potions out of his ancestral shop, the Dawakhana of Empathy. But unbeknownst to his neighbors, Temur had mastered the arts of subterfuge, illusion, guile, and disguise. Temur was half orphaned in his mother's womb after his father fell from a horse and broke his neck. As a consequence, Temur was a wild, siblingless child, the bane of his mother's existence, who gathered fame and curses around the neighborhood by squeezing through skylights and chimneys no wider than a man's hand. Look, look, O oh mother of Temur! Women would shout after him as he sped down the street with a stolen chicken leg neath his vest. There goes your thief again! Oh, if you can't take care of him, next time I will box his ears and redden his bottom for you. As a grown man, Tamur's many gifts and preoccupations included changing gold coins into tobacco leaves, replacing hand cattle with confused old men, and climbing up the sides of tall buildings without a handhold. Tamur was careful to limit his practice of these interests to nighttime or to other cities where he was less apt to be recognized. Yet one delight he found irresistible, which by its very nature had to be indulged closer to home, was to make fools of rich merchants who passed through the gates of Lahore in search of Red Street. This way, gentle sirs, Temur would cry, disguised as a fakir, after accosting them in Anarkali or by the blacksmith's gate, follow me and I shall take you to the alley that hides the opening to the wretched horrors of Red Street. Right you are, sir, the very one. Thus cajoling and enticing, Temur would lead these men down twisting streets until they reached narrow alleys impenetrable to their horses. The men would be forced to dismount, and as they did, Temur would pickpocket their purses and steal their rings and leave them yelling at a shadow, disappearing fast into the maze of back streets. Now, of course, you have heard the legend of Red Street and its claim to eminence? No, my august hosts? Indeed, and the mysterious epidemic that spread like an ill rumor through northern India? Well, it happened thus, my dear sirs and madams, that there came a time when from Lahore to Lucknow, 
the families of idolaters and iconoclasts alike were gripped by a gruesome sickness. Their women folk began to turn. Between the ages of 12 and 40, these unfortunates suddenly became vicious, venomous, and vile. Far from comforting their hardworking men, fetching them food when they returned home late at night, cutting them slices of mangoes, or pressing their sore legs, these wretches, were they berated even gently for good cause, would seize and fling the nearest pot or bucket filled with the day's garbage at the heads of their poor husbands, their earthly gods. May your face be blackened forever, you swine-faced dwarf, shouted one woman at the master of a household. May your mother turn inside out and squeeze you back in, yelled another. Some clawed at their men's faces, others kicked them in their ball sacks. A few went so thoroughly insane that they ripped their chadars and lifted their dresses and dashed into the street, lighting up the mohallas with the moons of their bountiful behinds. Ah, what dismay they caused! What horror they wrought into the hearts of their loved ones! Would that the earth had devoured me, wept one such man, before this evil should have come to my home! Would that the sky had swallowed me. Oh, why had it to be me, groaned another. Why mine? Strange, however, and noticed soon by the menfolk, was that this madness occurred for only a few days every month, usually around the lunar 14th. Come daybreak of the third or fourth day, the women would return to normalcy, their demeanors placid and their habits docile. They would in short again become the homemakers, peacemakers, Mohalla caretakers and keepers of gossip they were known to be. Inevitably, they were sat down, probed and prodded by their men and elders, mothers and grandmothers, among whom were some impertinent spinsters who said they didn't care and would welcome a little insanity themselves. Slowly but surely, a disturbing wild tale emerged, which made many a heart shiver and many a pair of hands come together in prayer, for none wished to have such a terror visited upon their household. Notably chronicled too was the fact that each woman described arriving at her strange destination the same way on the same night, although the distance between the affected houses was such that the fastest Arabian horse couldn't cross it in a month. The following is the tale the women, later referred to as the moon mad roses, told their men. And with your gracious permission, I shall now relate it to you. It has reached me, my auspicious friends, that one of the men said to his youthful spouse, what happens to you every month that you aggrieve me so? That fair woman replied, my dear husband, may my soul be sacrificed for you. Three, the romance of the red road and the one who called the travelers upon it. It happens to me the same way every month when the moon becomes bright and full like a huri's lips, there fall upon my window Three loud knocks. If I don't answer by the third, a smell fills the room, like raw meat or dung. It makes me gag until my head spins and I pass out. I'm out for days and I only awaken to the sound of everyone fussing over me, loosening the chains around my hands and feet. If I answer and open my window, there sits a pigeon on the sill. It gazes, me, it gazes at me with ebony eyes until I step onto the ledge. Allah be praised, it is no ordinary bird. Its beak is blue, its feathers ravish red. In its, in its shadow, the moonlight turns the color of blood. And as this devil bird snaps open its beak and gurgles, Gudrgoo! behind it materializes an opening made of moonbeams, a smoky cave hovering in the air. Whispers roll from the cave like a Turkish rug, soothing me, calling me inside. I leap off the ledge into the cave, my, cave mouth and find myself on a red brick road under a shining white moon. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you. So you said you, you wrote this because you were irked or hung up on what, what was it that, that hung you up in that? So the original story is Maruf the Cobbler 
from a thousand and one nights oh okay so it's the the man's story it's the man's story and in the original story the word that richard burton used for his wife fatima is fatima the dung and when i read that i was so annoyed <laughs> i wanted to tell fatima's story so this actually goes on to become it's a novel it's about 15000 words it goes on to become fatima's story and the maruf's name is never mentioned in the story he's only mentioned as m as m yep that i didn't realize it was that long when i read it gosh okay yeah it, but it, it nests but then um you emerge from the nests and um i kind of think it's kind of feminist are you a feminist i hope so okay <laughs> cool i i think you are yeah me too by the way um okay wait i have to ask one geeky question who is archiving your papers actually no one right now <laughs> You guys hear that? Nobody's archiving Usman's papers yet. Um, there's a special relationship between University of Pittsburgh, P Pittsburgh and, and Stoker Khan, right? Correct. Um, so UT, um, Texas A&M actually approached me. Yes, and you laughed and laughed? No, I, I did not. I declined because I was hoping that someone in Pakistan would want to archive them. Uh, and if anyone was going to do something about it, I wanted them to make the effort of going to Pakistan to do it. I have never been to Pakistan, but okay, maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, of all your published stories, um, I love the one that's hashtag spring love, hashtag Pichal Peri best. Um, one of the reviewers dinged it for wokeness. I saw that. <laughs> did you see that? I did see that. I, I'm going to quote for the audience here. The direct quote was something like, the story would have been fine without the woke referencing. Hell? What, what are you talking about? Uh, do you have any response that to, to that? Uh, so... Um... Uh, this is something I, um, I'm a strong believer in, and I really recommend it. Uh, we, we have so many wonderful professional writers here. I think that most of them would agree with me. It is a really bad idea to argue with a reviewer. <laughs> it is a yeah. really bad idea yeah. to ever respond to a reviewer, especially online, um, because there is nothing to be gained from making a response that way. If you are committed enough to make a response, I would do an essay. And I would do it rhetorically if you really, truly feel passionately about it. But it is not a good idea to individually argue with people. It has, it has, it never leads to good places. So my response at that point was, eh. <laughs> so, well, and this, this, we are streaming. So we are online too. I would, again, um, you know, everyone has a right to whatever they want to say about things. Um, I. I think we've talked about this to death by now. 80% of what people think about my work doesn't matter. 20% of what they say might matter. Um, and then I'll choose what I want to choose. Do you like that story? I really like that story. <laughs> and I kind of feel weird saying that. Um, it was the first story, I think, that I wrote when I moved back to Pakistan from Florida. And I was suddenly rethrust back into the world of my childhood. And suddenly that world had changed before my eyes. It was not the same place anymore. The past is another country, right? And so it was, the present was another country now. And um, I was like, what is even going on? When I was growing up, there were no Orat marches. Orat march is a women's march. And that was not happening when I was growing up. A transgender and intersex people were not walking in Pakistan, that was not happening. And this was happening. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. These uh, young people are changing the world and I am so excited for this. So I wanted to write a story about this, this sassy, punky, uh, backward-footed woman, uh, Pichal Perry, which is part of our folklore. And I wanted her to go to an art march and say, Pichal Perry's matter too. <laughs> 
right? We are people too. And I wanted, and I wanted to see her do it and I did it. Thank you. Cause like I said, I really, really enjoyed that one. I mean, you know, more than I enjoyed the, the enjoyment of the others I, that I also enjoyed. <laughs> Um, so you attended Clarion West in 2013, and now you're an instructor for the workshops first week. So is the workshop that you're teaching, is it different than the one that you went to? Has it changed a lot? And if so, how? Um, well, certainly we're not in the same place anymore. And I'm kind of relieved about that because that would have been tough walking into the same dorm. Um, we also ha had a haunted basement next door. Um, yeah. And we loved that. But these guys have a haunted, was it, is it a laundry? A haunted closet. Mm -hmm. So hauntings follow Clarion West everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, the workshop structure is definitely different. There are way many, many more options for the students to choose from. Um, there's definitely less rigidity, which I appreciate. Um, um, I think uh, the class is utterly brilliant. Um, it is just remarkable seeing them. Um, I'm appreciating the accessibility of Clarion West, of allowing people who are not able to join the class in person for any reason to be able to zoom in from their rooms or from elsewhere. And I believe Clarion West is going to be virtual every other year or something. So I think those yeah. are all good things. So it's all all good, all good. I ho I think so. I I'm I'm liking the way the it's moving, and I'm liking the way the workshop admin has been so open to change. And the board is, you know, I mean, we we do want things to change and for the better, and we want openness, right? So I mean, I'm happy about that. What about um the literary landscape in general, uh, or or the landscape of lit the literary fantastic in particular? Have those changed in the 11 years since you? Yeah, so um, we did talk about this a little bit. Um, when I went to Clarion West, there was still a little bit of a, not as red, but a little solid line between genre and litfic. I think I was asking the students about this, what the landscape is like now in their undergrad programs and in their MFAs. And it sounds like it's getting more porous and it's definitely more flexible and less rigid. So I feel like maybe that's changed. I do think that horror has come into its own again. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but horror had a terrible time back in the late 1980s and 1990s. It was the stepchild of specfic. No one wanted to write horror. It was the outcast, the misfit. Um, and it had basically imploded as a genre. Yeah. But right now, horror post 2008, 2007, um, horror has just taken off and it's not looking back. It is one of the hardest commodities in the market right now. Um, Stephen, remember, Stephen Graham Jones published 18 novels before he sold his William uh, Mongrels to William Morrow and then The Only Good Indians to uh, Joe Monty at Saga Press. Yeah. Okay, well, um, oh my gosh, I'm looking at your watch and it's like, how much more time do we have? Okay, well, I'm going to go with these three quotes that I took from previous interviews, which I invite anyone to put on a t-shirt or a bumper sticker or something. Um, and I'm going to ask you to um, to talk about them a little more. They came from you talking, but so you you can keep talking. So um, online has consequences. In response to a question about problematic writing forebears, such as Lovecraft, Kipling, and Poe, and I would add a few others to that, like Edgar Rice Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, and others. Um, you advise writers working in the genres that, that those authors represent. You say, smash their clay feet with the hammers of your vision and subversion. Do you stand by that? I don't even remember saying that. I I must have been high or drunk because that's just a pretty good line. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember saying that. I, I think it deserves a t-shirt, honestly. I absolutely stand by that. And I will say this openly online. I encourage aspiring writers, new writers, 
you know, experienced writers, read all problematic writers. Read them. I think absolutely read them. And if you don't read them, how are you going to smash those feet? Those little <laughs> teeny tiny Trump hand feats. <laughs> Okay. Uh, in response to a question about the attraction of writing horror, you say, we are drawn to what we fear the most, but why fear it in the first place? Can you elaborate on that? It's funny. We just did a horror workshop today. Um, I think that, um, I think we are drawn to what we fear the most is because we're trying to control it. Um, because a lot of fear is about non-existence and death. And sometimes when we mature enough, the fear is of not dying. Oh. So um, a lot of horror deals with that and plays with that. And I think um, uh, Laird Barron has a great title, The Beautiful Thing That Awaits Us All. Right? And so um, I think a lot of horror plays with that. We fear it. I mean, that's why we go to um, horror movies right? They're sims, they're practice for if something happens to us so we can control it if it ever happens to us. It's kind of exposure therapy. Oh, okay. Um, it's playing an RPG in our brain. And there's actually literally medical scientific evidence behind that. I knew you would bring that up. <laughs> um, and my third quote, um, I will preface this by saying um, I was on a panel recently about um, Afro-pessimism um, and um, the abject and, and how that related to Octavia Butler's work of, of, all, of all things. Um, so, um, and utopia and dystopia. Um, so in this interview, you were asked about whether you think of your work as utopian or dystopian. And your response was, you don't need to write dystopian fiction if you're living in Pakistan. <laughs> yes, so Pakistan has been living a dystopian nightmare for the past 50 years. Wow. Um, and Pakistan has not gotten out of it. Um, things are worsening, they're not getting better. So it is very sad. Um, last year, there was a uh, basically a major coup and then there was a big strike down and the popular prime minister was thrown in prison. He had his own issues too, but he was like the army. So students like you were standing with placards in front of the biggest, most powerful university in Lahore. And these students were the army, the police backed by the army, broke into the dorms, picked up the students and the faculty, took them in for 48 hours. They were tortured, some of them, right? They were abducted. One journalist was tortured so much that by the time he came out, he was like basically um, in a coma. Like he was, he was just, he, he had lost his ability to talk. So that kind, these kind of things are very real in the real world, right? And I think that um, uh, the U.S. is headed that way. I truly believe that we are seeing a decline. I, I'm hopeful. I still hope and pray because I love the U.S., as in my, it's my adopted homeland. It took me going back to Pakistan to fall in love with the U.S. Yeah. Um, truly, because below, before my move back, I didn't ever feel that I belonged in the U.S. I, I didn't have a sense of belonging. I just felt like an outsider. It took me going back home to realize I was not home anymore. I was not a Pakistani anymore. I was a Pakistani American. And uh, uh, and taking on and truly finally slipping on that cloak of double identity took some hard shaking. Um, I, I do think dystopia is, we're all facing dystopias of different sorts. And I, I encourage all of us in our spec fic, even if you write horror, you can play with the themes of horror, but I do think hope is essential. I think hope is extremely important. Playing with utopian ideas and trying to come up with those ideas is very important. So yes and no, it is, you, it is, you're writing both utopian and dystopian at the same time with one hand tied behind your back. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, uh, how, how much longer do we have? Yeah, okay. 
just one more. I have more questions. Uh, um, I wanted to ask about the Salam Award for imaginative fiction. Can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm so grateful to Clarion West and Locus Magazine in particular and Tor because they have really um, helped us with the Salam Award, getting the word out. In 2017, I when I came to Clarion West, even when I was here in my week one, I told Elizabeth Hand I wanted to set up a Clarion style situation for Pakistan. I knew that even then that I wanted to do it. Um, and um, post Clarion, I immediately did a one weekend workshop in Pakistan in 2014, uh, which did pretty well. We called it the Rising Dust Workshop. Right, the rising, the but, rising dust workshop, oh. because we're Indian people, right? Oh, and so um, I and I really liked that idea. Um, by the way, Pakistanis are very much Indian people, even though we hate to say it. <laughs> the word India comes from the river Indus, which is in Pakistan now. It's one of the great ironies of history, and so um, we're very much Indian people. I'm just gonna quickly move on before someone throws a shoe at me. <laughs> but um, yeah, so um, we did that workshop. And after that, in 2017, um, Tehseen Babija, um, a fan and a reader, approached me and wanted me to judge a contest of science fiction for Pakistani people. And we that's how the Salam Award started. It's for writers of Pakistani origin or writers resident in Pakistan. And um, Alhamdulillah, it has grown from a small thing to pretty much a pretty big thing. Last year, we had uh, Mirian Mohanraj and Liz Hand fly to Pakistan to teach a Clarion style workshop. And next year, I don't, I, I don't think I can quite say, it's not public yet, but okay. we have two incredible people, um, both of them who, who have been to Clarion as instructors, um, people you guys know very well, uh, they're going to be flying down to Pakistan to teach another workshop for 10 days. Um, yeah, so Salam Award itself and the workshop situation and the community has really grown. And the first Salam Award anthology came out this year. Wow. Yeah, of all the stories through the Salam Award, um, the finalists and the honorable mentions and the winners. Cool, cool. And it's named for a physicist? Yeah, so Dr. Abdus Salam the person who was responsible for the discovery of the Higgs boson particle. The God particle. The God particle. His work led to the discovery of the God particle. He was Pakistani. He is a minority Pakistani. So he, in 1973, um, as Pakistanis will, we disowned him. <laughs> right? So we declared him a non-Muslim. And Dr. Salam left the country in protest. And he went to... Um, I believe Britain first and then Italy. He wanted to establish a center for theoretical physics in Pakistan, which did not happen. But Salam, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics, wanted to be an English teacher Aww. Aww. before he did all that. And so we wanted, and because he was Mars, when he died, he asked that his body be buried in his village in Pakistan. So he was his body was buried in Pakistan, in Chung. It The gravestone said, first Muslim Nobel Prize winner. And some people came and struck Muslim off of his grave. So now it says first Nobel Prize winner, which is not true. <laughs> okay, so as I said, I have a lot more questions, but so what? Um, you guys have questions too, right? And if you raise your hand, then I will not ask mine. Um, repeat the, um, the proverb about um, it is the bow that carries the most fruit that bends the most as in and, Urdu. And now I'm having difficulty remembering the original Urdu. But I believe it's Wo shakh jo paldar hai, wohi jhukti hai. It is the bow laden with fruit that bends the most. Thank you. There was someone in the back. I can't see, but I see your hand, so I bow to you. What a great question. I did not expect that question here. But you need to repeat it. Yeah. So the question is, jinn to Muslims is part of our reality, right? And so the um, uh, the question is, how do, uh, how do I think about jinns, whether I possibly even believe in them or have, have had any encounters? Does that get it mostly right? Okay. So, so we can actually talk about that forever. <laughs> so in Ibn al-Arabi's treatise, Fatuhat-e-Makkah, the Meccan revelations, 
he gives seven interpretations of jinns. So the original jinn from Arabia are evil spirits or spirits, right? They haunt the, they're different variants, they're murids, they're whatever, they're ghouls, right? They're also jinns. But Ibn al-Arbi takes that one step apart. He thinks of angels and jinns as faculties of the divine. And he thinks of jinns as those faculties of love that strive towards movement. So that's one interpretation of jinn. The other one is, of course, that they are a separate species from us that move within us. So the word jinn is very much related to the word for heaven, jannah. It's very much related to the heaven, uh, to the word womb, jann, right? And so womb is where the baby hides. Jannah is the hidden garden of Eden. Jinn are the hidden people. Majnun, which is a famous lover in uh, Arabic folklore, Majnu is he who's been possessed by a jinn. So the jinn uh, um, uh, cosmology is just wonderful. Again, the root, the Semitic root is laden with meaning. Once you start, I highly recommend Ibn al-Arbi's work on this, if you're interested. But do you, are, do you believe in them? I don't believe in them, but I'm scared of them. <laughs> okay. So when the Salam Award was established, because Dr. Salam is an Ahmadi minority in Pakistan, um, there was an article in a radical publication in Pindi that basically called me a Jewish agent and an Ahmadi agent. And they basically said that this is anti-Islam activities and blah, blah. I had to remove all my parents. And I was living in the US at that time. I had to remove all my parents' information from online because I didn't. one of my friends called me, someone who used to be exposed to these radicals and he said, Usman, you need to take this seriously. This is not a joke. These people, this is a real radical publication. You can definitely get in trouble for this. And so um, I had to remove all my inf information. Since then, one of the things that fiction does is sideways stuff, right? I mean, that's how we hide so many things. I'm reading Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States right now, where he was talking about black literature in the 1930s and 20s and um, uh, how black art, how it was uh, subversive and resistant and how that resistance persisted before it broke through in the civil rights movement overtly. And I think that's what's happening in Pakistan. People are resisting through art. People are resisting in different ways. ways. And the best thing about this is our army is so dumb, they would not be able to read the subtext. I actually know of some Trump supporters who um, are fans of Octavia Butler, by the way. I think that proves your point. <laughs> you have admitted that you it, that it takes you several months to write a story, which it shows they're they're really, you know, they're thoughtfully crafted. Um, but how can you reconcile that with the idea of um one story a week? Um that is that is put out as what someone who attends Clarine West is supposed to be able to do. I pass on the question. Uh, okay, but um, do you have a favorite time of day to write? A favorite kind of pen or? I used to be a night owl. I wrote my first novel um, in six months, working from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. over six months. Um, I have since discovered it is not healthy for me. Um, I, I'm a big believer in self-care and protecting yourself and protecting your time, as I've been talking to students about this. I'm a big believer if your body is not doing well, it's going to be hard for you to be productive and do it. We've been talking about Cyril Connolly's obstacles in the way of art. Um, and health is one of them. So I, I have switched to morning writing and um, that has part, become part of my ritual and process. I'm not always able to achieve it. I also believe in not writing every day. Um, I don't think people need to write every day. I believe it was John Crowley. He said that writing is the only craft in the world that you can return to after five years of not practicing it and finding out that you're better. 
Um, and I truly believe that because I think we're growing and reading and evolving and thinking. Um, so my ritual involves allowing the art to come to me, um, that lively, understandable spirit to come to me and have faith in the spirit coming back to me. You you talk about a ritual. I myself, when I write, I I actually construct altars. You don't do that, though, do you? I think the way we organize things is kind of an altar now at our desk, the way we sit. Mm -hmm. I, I sympathize with that. Okay. Okay. So I can keep doing that? Yeah. 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 Um, is there any sort of writing that you're really, really longing to do that you haven't done yet? Like, do you want to write, I don't know, nursery rhymes or or comic books or plays or um, so i'm a failed poet right um i tried my hand at poetry a long time ago and found out i was terrible at it um, i would love to write poetry but i'm just not good at it um, recently because of certain situations one night i was really overwhelmed and i wrote my first poem in a decade and i found that i really liked that experience i'd like to try my hand at it again, at it again. I also have one, I'm not a big fantasy, like epic fantasy person. Um, I would love to try my hand at it. And there's something in my head that's been stuck for five years. Um, it's threatening to be a trilogy. I don't like trilogies all the time. <laughs> so I'm upset at that intrusion. Um, but I would like to try my hand at at least one epic fantasy. I can see everything in my head. So I'd like to try it out at some point seeing everything in your head it's like you're a visual writer but you are also talking about the music of language can you just pick one can you just be what can i say i'm a synesthetic mess okay. so for me writing is kind of like creating a puzzle i often start with images or ideas or even settings or characters something that compels me and I'm just trying to think about, and I think, and I think, um, I, I, I do, I run, I run to decompress. And so when I'm, I often find when I'm really stuck, I go for a walk or I go run. And if I listen to something, then my problem often doesn't get solved. So I need to not be listening to something. Um, I can listen to the road or the sound of traffic, or, you know, if I'm on a trail, that will work for me. But if I, there's actual impulses, I can't, I can't figure it out. Often. I have woken up at night with the solution in my head and I have lunged towards the desk so I can write it down before I forget it. Um, you know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein inception origin, evil origin story happened that way. There is that thing where she says that I was in that twilight zone between sleep and life or life and death. I forget the exact quote. I do think that those moments are important and recognizing them and trying to just grasp them when you can is important. I don't carry a notepad everywhere, um, but I make notes on my iPhone sometimes. I'm going to try and repeat that. How do you know when the story that you that comes to you is ready to be written? Um, it varies from stories to stories. There is one story that I wanted to write at, that I thought of at Clarion West that I've not been able to write yet. I don't know if I, I if I don't have the skills for that yet, but I would like to finish it someday. Um, again, it's story to story and writer to writer, so I can only speak for myself. Um, for me, when the stories, when I can see um, some sort of an arc, if I can see even a glimmer of a central image that anchors it or something compelling about it that makes me want to go explore it. Um, I also like big ideas. I'm a big idea person. I'm, a I'm, in I'm enthralled by big ideas, right? And I, I want that, you know, weird one thing that uh, maybe, I don't know, in City of Red Midnight, the idea was, could I do a nested story? But then I wanted to do body horror in Arabian Nights. I was like, how, how, how would that work? I got excited about it. So when, when that excitement starts coming, that's when I usually, I think I'm ready. Excitement, yeah, I think that's, I think that's what you boiled it down to there. Someone else had their hand up. Yeah. I'm, I did not hear that. So um, I've talked about the musicality of language being important to me. And um, the question is, um, how when, how do you edit that later on? 
Um, and how do you retrospectively go back and maintain and sustain the musicality while editing? Um, so often I think that when I'm writing things in a gush, I sometimes literally will just keep writing and letting the words lead me. I have ADHD, so it's easy to just kind of go on a rant. And if the rant comes to me, I accept it and I follow the music. And once it's done, then sometimes I'll put it away and I'll go back and I'll try to read it out loud to see what fits there for me and what doesn't. And remember, Indian music is actually slightly different from Western music. Even the beats are different. And so for me, the beat of the music is sometimes different. And I try to follow that. I think sometimes that just comes after a while with practice. You know, you listen, you read in both languages or you listen to both languages, you talk in both languages. I especially encourage people to read poetry in two languages if you can, because there's something about that that just busts, that breaks my mind open. I think that should be it, right? Yes, yes. Um, so 